I also want to start out by thanking everyone for coming to this Sales 3.0 conference, the first Sales 3.0 conference ever. Uh, we started Sales 2.0 10 years ago. And uh, I distinctly remember Jeffrey Moore being uh, on stage and uh, he got challenged and everybody was nervous about the future. And uh, the that was the beginning of the Sales 2.0 era. And everything accelerated and it, uh, people, people's faces sort of glossed over because there was so much information coming at them. And that was the age of, uh, the, the challenge was how to manage information. But now as we move to 3.0, we need to manage transformation. We need to keep up with the trend. Uh, but before I start my presentation, I want to thank uh, Roberto, stand up please. Uh, he came all the way from Italy and today is his birthday. So <laughs> let's wish him a happy birthday. Um, how do you say Bona Campriano? Buon compleanno, yes. Molto bene. <laughs> Mille grazie. <laughs> so, one more thing. As you sort of transition from coming to this conference, looking at your, your agenda for today, looking at your intentions, and um, Alice reminded me of the Peak Performance Mindset course, and there's one quick exercise I want to start out with to sort of cleanse the palate, clean the mind. And I want you to close your eyes for a moment. Close all your eyes and relax. And as you breathe in, you tell yourself, I'm aware of my body. And as you breathe out, you say, I'm letting go of all my tensions. And do it five times as you breathe in. I'm aware of my body. As you breathe out, I'm letting go of my tension. I want you to be relaxed and comfortable and ready for the sales 3.0 message. One more breath. I'm aware of my body. I'm letting go of all my tension. So, what is sales 3.0? What is my agenda? My agenda today is to share with you my perception of the movement from 1.0 to 2.0 to 3.0. I want to talk quickly about the rise of artificial intelligence, of machine learning, advanced analytics, and virtual reality, and how it's going to change the world. Uh, I want to talk about the side effects of technology and how you can avoid the high cost that comes with it. Because technology, in my view, is like medicine. It does wonderful things, but it also has side effects. Uh, the need for a digital transformation mindset, and then I will share my five predictions for the future of selling in the next five to 10 years. This is where I grew up in an analog world, in a little village in Austria. And that's my grandmother <clears throat> behind in the, under the door frame. It's my first day of school. And I grew up in Salz uh, near Salzburg. Uh, Salzburg is the uh, place where Sound of Music was filmed. And I have personally gone through a lot of transformations from that place living in Paris for two and a half years, uh, moving to the United States, starting Selling Power magazine from nothing with an eight-page newspaper tabloid in 1981, and moving forward and building the largest sales management magazine in the country with over 150,000 circulation, and having the privilege of interviewing people like uh, Mark Benioff, um, worked with him for about five years, uh, to get his company started. Uh, we interviewed uh, Richard Branson, um, Matt Gill from a brewery in um, Los Angeles, and Bill McDermott. Uh, we have become good friends. He's the uh, CEO of SAP, and uh, 
That is a company that's valued now at $114 billion. And um, Donald Trump, we call him the shy guy on, uh, on the cover. That was 15 years ago. And uh, Bob Carr, who is with, uh, here with us today. Give a big hand to Bob Carr. Stand up. And also, I looked at the um, selling power of 500. We track every year the 500 largest sales organizations in America and taking the pulse and see what has changed in those organizations since 2002. So we're 15 years worth of data, and I want to share that with you, and you're going to be very surprised um, at the impact sales 2.0 had, and then we can extrapolate what uh, sales 3.0 is all about and what to expect. Sales 1.0, we did a cover story a long time ago on John Henry Patterson, who was the founder of Modern Selling. He invented the protected territories. He invented direct mail advertising. Uh, he created that memorized sales pitch that salespeople needed to deliver. And he hired elocutionists and, uh, and people from the theater to teach salespeople how to act out a performance. So it was all about repetition. And that was the first sales training class in 1896. Uh, Kodak had, uh, Jeff Hazlett is, is going to be with, with us today at a late flight. Uh, so he'll, he'll show up probably mid-morning. But uh, the sales department reported to advertising. So the advertising manager was the key person in the organization. And then it changed to uh, the VP of sales, VP of marketing. And um, outside salespeople were called shiny shoes. And the performance driver was hustling. And nothing has changed since sales 1.0. Um, I mean, a lot has changed, but the hustle has not changed. And the old tactics, uh, when you think about the 50s, it was the three martini lunch. Uh, you see it in the Mad Men. Uh, you remember Gerald Ford saying that the three martini lunch is the epitome of American efficiency. So all those days have gone, but what has stayed is the hustle to be genuinely interested in other people. To, uh, uh, like Elmer Wheeler said, don't sell the steak, sell the sizzle. And a positive mental attitude, although a lot of people are beginning to question, is the, a positive mental attitude really the best way? to create positive expectations uh, in sales. And then sales 2.0 came along. That's when everything moved online. So you replace the Rolodex uh, with something in the cloud, and the IBM typewriter disappeared. And salespeople no longer carried uh, Coda carousel projectors to their customers to group demonstrations. How many people still remember all those tools? Yeah, a lot. And uh, so cloud computing became the main driver, technology driver, to accelerate sales. And the key trends were social, mobile, big data, clouds, and uh, cloud and analytics. So the other th shift was that in 1.0, selling was an art. And in 2.0, we had many conversations about to what degree is sales an art, to what degree is it a science. And we came up with, uh, after many conversations in many conferences, that it's both. It's an art and a science. The art will never go away, but the science will take over. <laughs> so sales 2.0 is more 50-50. But as we move to 3.0, it will change. The ratio will change and will be more science. And the core success factors in the 2.0 era were focus on the customer experience, measure the customer experience, anticipate um, what the experience will look like a year from now and plan for it and make it part of your strategy. Salespeople need, needed to become the trusted advisor. And uh, sales managers needed to create a metrics-driven sales organization. If you cannot measure it, you cannot change it. And you shift uh, your strategy by integrating analytics into your sales process and master social media. And social media, in the beginning, was viewed as a big distraction until people discovered on how to use social media at the top of the funnel and make more connections. 
And then came the application explosion, and Apple was leading, and Mark Benioff was sort of taking the lead from Apple and say, well, I can create an app exchange. So um, Apple has uh, over 2 million apps now, and uh, Salesforce has 2,948. Um, and when you go to Dreamforce, I mean, the last time I was at Dreamforce, I thought, this is amazing. There are 150,000 people uh, going to that conference, and it looked to me like a technology flea market. And that will change, too, because now we need apps to find the right apps. And a lot of people, <laughs> yeah, um, a, a lot of people already are cutting down on the number of apps. And, and the challenge, the big challenge is integration. So here's the interesting thing. This is the bottom line of the sales 2.0 era. I went back to all those selling power 500 and I picked out the 200 largest sales organizations in the service field. And in the aggregate, those 200 organizations did a sales volume of $1.4 trillion. That's a lot of money. And I wanted to know how does it track with the uh, number of employees, the number of salespeople, and sales volume. So I want to walk you through. Those companies moved sales up from $1.4 trillion to $3.1 trillion, an increase of 122% in the service industry. Now, the number of employees went up. 45% more people are employed now by service organizations than 15 years ago, which is a huge increase, a huge amount of cost. But then you look at sales, and here's the astonishing thing, that the number of salespeople those 200 companies employed went from 900,000 down to 600,000 by 33%. And that is a lot. But at the same time, because of technology, the sales per rep went up by 233%. So you see the bottom line. Sales 2.0 was an era where salespeople were taught to follow a process, to aggressively use technology, to up their sales. At the same time, the company cut the headcount. So technology does have an effect on employment in sales, but it doesn't have that effect on employment in other departments. So the non-sales departments that are supporting sales, they increase the headcount. So now you have sales operations, you have sales enablement, uh, you have sales support, you have marketing, uh, you have the division of labor within the sales department, DSR, sales development reps, business development reps, small account reps, medium account reps, enterprise reps. So there is a pro proliferation of titles. And the support also changes, like IBM has uh, in the digital sales division of 2,000 people, they have 30 hap chief happiness officers. So there's a lot more support, emotional support as well. Michael Dell said in a recent keynote, everything accelerates by 10x. And that means processing speed and computing power and uh, storage capacity. So there is so much innovation going on that we call this next era sales 3.0. And here are the technologies that allow that digital transformation. And the first one is it started in manufacturing. When you go to Spartanburg, North Carolina, and look at the BMW plant, you almost don't see any more people because there are robotics. There is a workflow uh, that allows the customer to order their BMW the way they want it, configured the same way like what Dell did 15 years ago when he allowed people to configure their laptop. You can, can configure your car and get it within six to eight weeks. Uh, same in med medicine, there's a digital surgery suite now available with access as a surgeon uh, to the latest data from IBM Watson and, uh, and you see models of complex operation that when something unexpected comes, you can look it up, but also the diagnostics. 
are no longer done before the operation, they're done during the operation and the doctor can make changes in real time depending on the data. So it's a data-driven op operation. Same with uh, transportation in Pittsburgh, you have Uber um, available and you can call up and, uh, and order a driverless car. Um, Budweiser did a stunt by delivering beer in a truck that had no driver. And in a lot of campuses today in, in universities and corporate campuses, you have driverless shuttles. So that is the new world of 3.0. And here's the reaction of people. Um, you know, we need to create a digital transformation strategy it is really an innovative approach, but I'm afraid we can consider it. It's never been done before. So the older generation is very suspicious of digital transformation, and they don't think it should be a priority or it should be a necessity. So a recent survey by Capgemini said that only 27% of senior executives believe that digital transformation is a matter of survival. And digital transformation is threatening all our livelihood. And I can say this because I've been through, been there, done that, as a publisher looking at the shift from print to online and shifting advertising revenue and seeing advertising revenues go from about $4.5 million a year to about 800,000 in like three years or four years. We had to transform radically. We had to digitize the magazine. We had to move online. We had to find a different uh, distribution system. We had to reinvent ourselves, and it was painful. And I resented Google for it, <laughs> but we're, now we are part of the, the, the digital age, and I would say it was the best experience I can think of because it wakes you up. And with every age in a corporation and every age as a person, you need to re-earn your future. You need to earn your keep. You need to adapt, and you need to expect that from your sales organization. So companies with a stronger transformation management intensity are more profitable, and they achieve higher market valuation. And that's obvious, but it needs to become part of the mindset in the C-level suite. So here are the quick four technologies. You know about them. Artificial intelligence is number one. And there are a, couple, a number of vendors out there, like Altify, that uh, they, they have a wonderful book out there that I saw this morning uh, that talks about the, how artificial intelligence is going to change the game of selling. And uh, when you look at the money trail, where the money goes, a lot of money flows into the AI community. And you may ask yourself, why is that? You know, why is that so hot? Uh, because of two factors. One is that we live in an increasingly connected world. We live in the world of Internet of Things, where everything, uh, the, and there's so many connections to understand. At the same time, there's more and more data, and it exceeds our capacity to look at that data and analyze it. So you need to have a machine looking at that and achieve intelligent automation through artificial intelligence. And the promise is you double your growth. Um, and I remember when I was preparing the presentation, I, I was looking just at CPQ, and I wanted to find an image for a configuration price quote. And um, so then I clicked on that image because Google Image Search invites you to visit that website. So I went to the website, and it said, hello, Gerhard Schwartner. How amazing is that? How did they know? How did Oracle know that it's me? It's my computer speaking to their computer. And they invited me for, to a chat. So that is the new way of engaging customers, where you have an enhanced digital experience. And you can only do it with artificial intelligence. So there are going to be more and more virtual agents and chatbots and interactions. So this is a top of the funnel technology that will threaten the livelihood of um, account reps that um, just make prospecting calls. So uh, prospects 
will come to a larger and larger degree from online and not from outsourced departments in, in India and the Philippines or in Manila. Machine learning, and that is another, uh, IBM calls it cognitive computing, where you don't have to program the machine. It learns for you, it sends you the information. So as a sales manager, you could get uh, a message, an alert that uh, he is one of your sales reps that needs coaching in one area because something happened that a deal got stuck in the pipeline and you don't have to follow everything and track everything because you don't have the time to follow everything and track everything. And machine learning has a lot of different apps, um, sales marketing, and one of the things to, to understand it very quickly is look at the bottom line. Netflix uh, makes recommendations based on your viewing habits. And, uh, and that kind of intelligence will be in a sales organization, will be in marketing, and will make life a lot easier for you. And then we have analytics, and you know about that because analytics have been around for the last four or five years. But they become, we're moving more from uh, analyzing after the fact to predictive analytics so we can predict our revenue. And there are organizations that can uh, forecast uh, to an accuracy factor of about 95, 97%, whereas most sales organizations right now without analytics um, they barely achieve uh, a 50% uh, hit ratio. Another exciting technology is virtual reality. Uh, Gartner predicts that by 2020 there will be 100 million headsets. Uh, how does it impact sales? Sales enablement people are already looking at that because in sales training people, because there are already companies available that allow virtual simulations without having a customer in there so you can program the simulation and deal with the body language, with, with the human side and with the, with the cognitive side of the brain. So you can improve human performance with virtual reality. Same with virtual sales demos. You can literally go as a, let's say you attract a salesperson and sell mining equipment or you sell farm equipment and you don't want to bring that expensive machinery that is uh, in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to the customer's site and give the customer a virtual reality headset and they can visualize how that works. So virtual demonstrations going to be uh, the norm in, within the next five years. So bottom line, the sales performance driver is science. We're no longer uh, allowed to make decisions based on hunches. We need to make decisions as sales leaders based on science. And the key factors that drive sales success, they never change. From a business perspective, you realize that it's all about people, process, and technology. So we need to align people to the process. We need to integrate technology with the process. And if you do your job right, then you can accelerate that process. And on a personal level, it is very similar. There are three factors. In order to be successful professionally, you need to have the right mindset. You have to have the right skill set and the right tool set. So we need to align that mindset with the skill set and tool set. And for anybody who has ever competed in sports, uh, you know that it's 80% mindset and 20% skill set. So if you have the will to win, um, a lot of, uh, I, I want to share a, a quick story uh, because the, there was an, uh, I was watching a golf game and Justin Rose and, um, and what was the Spaniard? Garcia, Garcia right. Uh, they were battling it out, and, uh, and Garcia won, and Justin Rose missed that one long putt, and he could have won, and that putt cost him like $700,000, but he didn't care. Uh, but th then I looked up the, the story of Justin. When he was 17, he almost won the British Open, and he uh, immediately decided to go pro as a 17-year-old kid. And then he missed the next 21 consecutive cuts. He could not enter a tournament if his life depended on it. 
So he went to a, psych a sports psychologist and said, what am I doing wrong? Because when I compete and, and uh, try to qualify, I miss a putt, I hit a, a shot in the woods, I'm terrible, but I know I can do better. And the psychologist asked him, why do you play golf? And he says, well, it's obvious. I want to win money. I want to make money. I want to create a future. I want to be in the newspapers. I want to, uh, you know, uh, I want to be better than Tiger Woods. And the, and the psychologist said, this is all external. You need to shift your mindset. And unless you know the why, and unless that why comes from deep inside you, you're not going to make it. Because the bigger the why, the bigger the try, the easier the how. So he taught himself, and in many conversations with the sports psychologist, that what really counts is the self-development, creating a better version of Justin Rose, and working from the inside out. So he wanted to become the best version of himself, which meant that he had to exclude the distracting thoughts from his mind. So when you are addressing the ball, you don't want to think about the shot before, and you don't want to think about the leaderboard. You don't want to think about the foursome uh, on the green that, that you are with. You don't want to think about the outcome or your, about your plane ride home. You want to focus in the present moment, in the here and now. So after being clear about the why and following the prescription, he won the US Open. So think about your whys and think about the whys of your salespeople. And uh, later on, we have a conversation with uh, Bob Carr. And he can attest to that because uh, he created a, uh, a $4.3 billion company in uh, a, a very short frame, uh, time frame. But he focused on the salesperson. And if you, as a sales leader, create a great experience for the salesperson and help salespeople be clear about the why, then they create a better experience for the customer and for the company. All right, we need to master information in 2.0, in 3.0. The goal is to master transformation. And the transformation has two components. One is the technology transformation, and the second one is self-transformation. One doesn't go with the other. And a lot of technology fans, they forget their humanity. And we need to remind them that humanity is important. So the big challenge is, how do we get people to that place? And technology makes sales teams more productive. It makes life sweeter, but 37% of employees serve online constantly. You're laughing. It's absurd. It's excessive. Between 60 and 80% of time spent on the internet at work has nothing to do with work. That's another survey. <laughs> and this is not something that I'm bringing up to be anti-technology. I don't want everybody to become a Luddite and say we, uh, we cut it up. But we need to be aware that technology has side effects on the human brain. And you don't want to have your children when they're less than two years old being exposed to the a digital babysitter, because def digitally deficient brains lead to efficiency drains. And it affects everybody. So technology is like medicine. Spam costs American businesses $20 billion a year. And spammers make only $200 million. It's a gigantic waste, but it's a game for them. Same thing with hacking. Hackers make, uh, make very little money, but the cost to business is $100 billion. And uh, Bob Carr has a hacking story for you that makes you uh, 
that probably will make you furious like, like he was when it happened to his company. Plus, hacking costs 500,000 jobs. Uh, there's a, a, a South African uh, uh, expert who says that uh, he uses the term digital cocaine, that uh, uh, the internet has a similar effect on the brain as cocaine and that it continues to stimulate the brain and each time you go back you need more and more and more until you get addicted and you don't know that you get addicted and I had conversations with some people in Silicon Valley that have recognized that, that uh, have, uh, have felt that addiction and I want to remind you in the 50s doctors promoted smoking and smoking is not good for your health. But it took 15 years until those doctors found out there's a connection with cancer. And it took until 1985 until people realized that and acknowledged, the industry acknowledged, that nicotine is addictive because it affects the brain. And you want more, and you want more, and you want more. And internet addiction now is a syndrome. It's called the Internet Addiction Disorder, IAD. And over 12 million Americans suffer from those online addictions. And the cost is huge because there's online gaming, gambling, social media, and the cost is about $300 billion a year in lost productivity, but also in curing people and helping people go back. There's a company called Restart that fixes you with digitally addicted employees um, in 45 to 60 days, and it costs you between $25,000 and $45,000 per person. It's a huge cost. Nobody talks about this in the tech industry. And, and, none of, and, and I had hesitation to bring this up in a technology, sales technology conference because it's the big elephant in the room. And we need to address it. We need to become a more conscious enterprise. We need to become more conscious leaders. We need to become part of the cure and not be enablers of sales addiction. Or, uh, I'm not going to go into this. I'm, I'm going to leave it in the handouts. Uh, there's my recipe for smartphone addiction. Uh, we need to learn how to practice mindfulness at work. Uh, mindfulness now is a billion dollar industry. And here are my five predictions. And some of them may be controversial and some of them may be a little scary, but I firmly believe that those numbers are accurate. Over the next 10 years, there will be over 10,000 highly successful technology startups. Every year, there are 1.5 million startups around the world. We're competing globally. And it's so easy to start a new technology company in India or in, in the Ukraine um, or anywhere in the world. And those 10,000 companies that really stand out, that will have an innovative capacity that far outstrips what you get today from the regular big leading companies. And my prediction is that 50% of those leading companies today will not exist 10 years from now. Because the larger the company, the harder it is to be innovative across the board. We had a conversation last night with uh, someone from IBM. And he said, we are scared of those Startups. In another survey from uh, Dell Computer, where they interviewed 4,000 executives, they say 45% of executives are worried about their company's future three to four years from now. And half of those executives surveyed, they said they have no idea where their industry is headed in the next five years. So innovation is a mandate in every company. And all successful companies will be 100% digital by 2020, and that's something I learned from Forrester Research, and I'm just adding this. Um, so if you're not along the way with digital transformation, uh, this is the time to do it. 
My prediction is also that 3 million sales jobs will disappear in five years. Half of those jobs, or more than half, will be due to technology, because technology can do it better than a salesperson. And a large portion of those jobs is going to be outsourced to the Philippines, to India, to Pakistan, uh, to English-speaking countries. I know that currently there are about um, a million outsourced sales jobs in the Philippines that work for American companies. And this is all stuff that uh, nobody tracks um, and nobody pays attention to. But we need to take all this information and roll it into a survival imperative. If you as a sales leader set a goal to achieve a 200% increase in sales from your sales force in five years, then you have a safety net. But at the same time, you need to think about cutting the headcount by 20%. You want to be probably more aggressive and make it 30%. But that is the goal for survival in the digital transformation age. Technology will accelerate everything. And if you don't out-innovate your competition, you need to look for another job. So as leaders, we need to transform digitally and personally. And we need to have that digital transformation mindset and that personal peak performance mindset. We need to look at human performance through different eyes and address those issues uh, with vigor from a different perspective and help people become more human and more effective and be clear about the why they're doing what they're doing. And my final comment is that the future depends on how well we integrate technology so that our world becomes more peaceful, that our companies become more successful, and that our lives become more meaningful. Thank you very much.